Graphs, also known as networks, are everywhere and have widespread applications as models of real-world phenomena. However, these days many real-world graphs are gigantic and in many cases it is impossible to know the complete structure at any given time. So it would be nice to have some sort of idealized approximations which can be fully understood and retain many features of large real-world graphs. This is the motivation for the subject of graph limit theory. In mathematics, a common way to approximate is to embed some space inside a complete space. For example, the set of rational numbers is contained in the set of real numbers, which is complete, and real numbers are limits of sequences of rational numbers. We often hear about rational approximations to pi, but we can also turn this around. The real number pi can be thought of as an idealized mathematical approximation of the complicated rational numbers that one obtains by measuring circles in the real world. We would like to do something similar, but the role of the rational numbers will be played by graphs instead. We would like to embed the space of graphs in a complete space, but what should the limit object be? There are actually many different graph limit theories, each of which has its own strengths and weaknesses. For example, there is the theory of graphons. In this theory, a graph is first converted into a matrix, which is called the adjacency matrix of the graph. In this matrix, the entry in the i-th row and j-th column is 1 if vertices i and j are connected and 0 if they are not connected. Then the adjacency matrix is turned into a picture with black and white pixels, black for 1 and white for 0. As the graphs get larger and larger, their pixel pictures get finer and finer, and the density of black pixels in a region can be approximated by a grayscale value. Assigning a number between 0 and 1 to each grayscale value, based on its darkness, the limit objects become certain functions on the square which take values in the unit interval. These functions are called graphons. This works well for so-called dense sequences of graphs, where the number of edges grows like the square of the number of vertices. But what happens for sparse sequences of graphs where there are fewer edges? Consider, for example, the path graphs, whose pixel pictures look like this. As the paths get longer and longer, the proportion of black pixels goes to zero in every region of the picture. So the limiting graphon is just zero everywhere. And this is true for every sparse sequence of graphs, not just the path graphs. So the theory of graphons simply cannot differentiate between different types of sparse sequences of graphs. For that, we will need a different graph limit theory. But before we get into the details, Let's see what you might come up with if you were asked to create a graph limit theory which works well for path graphs. So you have been given a sequence of longer and longer path graphs and been asked what's the limit? A good first guess is that it should be a path graph of infinite length, but there are at least two different options here. It could be the path graph which extends infinitely in one direction but not the other. Another option is the path graph, which extends infinitely in both directions. These two are not the same, because one of them has a vertex with only one neighbor and the other does not. So, which infinite path should you choose to be the limit of the finite path graphs? To decide, consider the following experiment. Choose a random vertex of a path graph and consider a box containing a small neighborhood around this vertex. As we resample the random vertex again and again, inside of this box we will see a portion of the graph from the perspective of the randomly chosen vertex. If we increase the length of the path graph, we will be less likely to see the ends of the path inside our little box. Of course, it is still possible to see the ends of the path and if we increase the size of the box, we will have a bigger chance of doing so. But if the box remains fixed in size, then as the path graph gets longer, 
the probability of seeing an end of the graph and the box gets smaller. In fact, for any fixed box size, we can find a path which is long enough so that 99% of the time we do not see an end of the path in the box. This suggests that the correct limit of the sequence of finite path graphs is the two-way infinite path rather than the one-way infinite path. In this experiment, we examined small neighborhoods around a certain vertex and we sampled that vertex randomly to get a statistical picture of the graph as a whole. But how do we formalize this into a consistent theory that will work for all sparse sequences of graphs and not just the path graphs? First, we will consider a set GD dot of rooted connected graphs which are denoted G dot. In this video, our sparseness condition will be that the degrees of the graphs in question are bounded by some integer called d. We will also denote these rooted graphs by pairs g rho, where g is a connected graph where each vertex has not more than d neighbors and rho is a specified vertex of g called the root. Here is an example of a rooted graph. The highlighted vertex is the root. This rooted graph is in G4 dot, because all of its vertices have degree 4 or less. However, it is not in G3 dot, because there are vertices with more than 3 neighbors. Given a non-negative integer r, we can consider the ball of radius r in a rooted graph G rho. This is defined to be the rooted subgraph of G induced by all vertices whose distance from rho is at most r. For example, the zero ball in any rooted graph is just the root. The one ball consists of the root and the neighbors of the root, including connections between the neighbors. The two ball adds the vertices at distance 2 from the root, and so on. If a graph is finite, then all large enough R balls will be the same. Now, when we chose a random vertex of the path graph, we were in a sense choosing a random rooted graph. So, given any unrooted finite graph, we will turn it into a random rooted graph by choosing the root uniformly among the vertices of the graph. In this example, we obtain the following distribution of rooted graphs, each with probability one quarter. Of course, the bottom two graphs are isomorphic as rooted graphs, so this is what the true distribution of our example random rooted graph looks like. Notice that a random rooted graph is simply a random variable which takes values in GD dot, the set of rooted graphs. We will denote random rooted graphs with boldface letters, still keeping the dot to denote the rootedness. And we say that G is the limit of the random rooted graphs GN if and only if, for all natural numbers R and for all fixed rooted graphs H in G D dot, the probability that the R ball in G equals the R ball in H is the limit of the corresponding probabilities for G N. So, going back to our sequence of path graphs, we identify each unrooted path graph with a random rooted graph such that each vertex is chosen as the root with probability 1 over n. And our experiment suggested that the limit of these random rooted graphs is the random rooted graph which is the rooted two-way infinite path with probability 1. Since we are identifying the two, we might as well say that this random rooted graph is also the limit of the fixed unrooted path graphs that we started with. So the limit of a sequence of fixed unrooted graphs turns out to be a random rooted graph. In this case, its distribution happens to be concentrated on a single graph, but this does not always happen. For example, consider the following sequence of graphs, each of which looks like a comb glued to a path on one end. One third of the vertices are in the base of the comb, one third of them are the teeth of the comb, and one third are in the path. Much like in the path example, 
As n grows large, any small box around the vertex is unlikely to contain the end of the comb or the path, or the part of the graph where the comb and the path are joined together. So the limit is this random rooted graph. With probability one third, it will be an infinite comb rooted at a point on the base. With probability one third, it will be an infinite comb rooted at a tooth of the comb. And with probability one third, it will be a rooted two-way infinite path graph. This may seem counterintuitive or even confusing, so it is definitely worthwhile at this stage to try and verify for yourself that all of this makes sense using the definitions from earlier in the video. Here is another example. Let Gn be the cycle graph with n vertices. As long as n is greater than 2r plus 1, the r ball around any vertex of the cycle is isomorphic to a path graph rooted in the middle. So the limit of the unrooted cycle graphs is again the random rooted graph which is concentrated on the rooted two-way infinite path graph. Somehow the fact that the cycle is connected to itself on the opposite side is lost in the limit. This is analogous to how it is difficult to see the curvature of the earth when you are standing on it and it is why the type of convergence we have described is often called local convergence. What if we consider the sequence of square n by n grid graphs? Analogously to the limit of the path graphs, the limit here is concentrated on the rooted grid which extends infinitely in all directions. This works for much the same reasons as the path example, because the number of vertices in the boundary of the finite grid is asymptotically small compared with the number of vertices in the whole grid. But what about this sequence of graphs, where at each stage every degree 1 vertex sprouts two new neighbors? What is the random rooted graph which is the limit of this sequence? For extra points, try to work out exactly what the limit should be. But how do we even know that there is a limit for that last sequence of graphs? Surely there are some sequences which don't converge at all, right? Well, yes, there are, but actually every sequence of graphs with uniformly bounded maximum degree at least has a subsequence which converges in the sense which we have described. To prove this, we will need to invoke some powerful tools from probability theory. For this section, we will also need to assume some familiarity with the general topology. Indeed, the local convergence we have described turns the set of random rooted graphs into a compact topological space. First of all, a random rooted graph can be identified with a Borel probability measure on GD dot, namely its probability distribution. With this identification, the local convergence of random rooted graphs we have described is the same thing as weak convergence of probability measures. Now, we won't define what weak convergence is in its full generality, but we will state a theorem about it due to Prokhorov. Suppose X is a compact separable metric space. Let P of X be the set of all Borel probability measures on X. Then P of X, with the topology of weak convergence, is also compact. We would like to apply this theorem to our space of rooted graphs GD dot. But to do this, we need GD dot to be a compact separable metric space. Currently, it is just a set of rooted graphs with no additional structure. A metric space is a set with a distance function. So given two fixed rooted graphs, we must define a distance between them which we will denote by d local. We start by considering the set of natural numbers r such that the ball of radius r in g.1 is not isomorphic to the ball of radius r in g.2. Next, take the minimum value of this set. Now raise 2 to the power of this number. And, finally, take the reciprocal of the result. It looks a bit complicated, so let's try an example computation. What is the local distance between these two graphs? 
We've drawn them so that the root is at the top and the R balls are easy to see. Both zero balls are just the root, as always, and so they are equal. The one balls are also equal, as are the two balls, but oh, now the three balls are not isomorphic to each other. Since this is the first value of R where this happens, the local distance between these two graphs is 1 over 2 cubed. Now, the four balls are also not isomorphic, but since 4 is larger than 3, this does not change our computed value of the local distance. Another way to think of this distance is to notice that it is a decreasing function of the number of steps one has to take away from the root in order to tell that two graphs are non-isomorphic. In other words, the further one has to look away from the root to notice the difference between two graphs, the closer the two graphs are in the local distance. Now, with the local distance, the set GD dot becomes a metric space and it is compact and separable. These things are not immediately obvious, but it is a good exercise to try and prove these three facts for yourself. As a hint for the compactness, remember that since we are working in a metric space, we must only prove sequential compactness. Also remember that we are considering only sequences of graphs with uniformly bounded maximum degree. If we look at the sequence of star graphs, which does not have uniformly bounded maximum degree, we notice that every graph in the sequence is a distance half from every other graph in the sequence. Thus the sequence of star graphs cannot have a convergent subsequence in the local metric we have defined on rooted graphs. In any case, Prokhorov's theorem now implies that the space of Borel probability measures on GD dot is compact with respect to the weak convergence topology. And since probability measures on GD dot are the same thing as random rooted graphs, this means that the space of random rooted graphs with the topology of local convergence, which we have defined, is also compact. Thus, every sequence of random rooted graphs has a subsequence which converges. In particular, if we consider any sequence of fixed unrooted graphs with uniformly bounded maximum degree, there is a subsequence which converges to some random rooted graph. So, we have created a compact space which contains a set of graphs as a subspace. In other words, we have constructed a graph limit theory. This particular graph limit theory is often called local convergence or benjamin Schramm convergence, named after the mathematicians who discovered it. Now that we have it, what do we do with it? Well, there are many directions one could go from here. For instance, there are applications of this theory in proving theorems about graphs. Many of these applications come from various continuity theorems, which state that certain parameters of a sequence of graphs can be approximated by the corresponding parameter of the graph limit. Additionally, there are connections with other areas of mathematics, such as percolation theory and group theory. These connections give us new ways to interpret statements in one or another theory and in some cases lead to very deep open problems. We plan to discuss these topics in future videos, so if you liked this video, please subscribe. And of course, thank you for watching.